This is Office Hours at Duke University, a venue for engaging with Duke faculty on ideas, opinions, and events of the day. Today, you are invited to join a conversation about the many implications of the oil gushing into the Gulf of Mexico. To do that, send a question by email to live at duke.edu. You can tweet your question with the tag Duke Live or post it to the Duke University Facebook page. I'm James Todd with Duke's News Office, and here with me is Tim Profeta. He is the director of Duke's Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. Tim, thanks for you for being here. Thank you for having me. And we should say that uh, before coming to Duke, uh, Mr. Profeta, you served as counsel for the Environment to Senator Joseph Lieberman. Joining us by video conference is Professor Larry Crowder. He is the Stephen Toth Professor of Marine Biology and director of the Center for Marine Conservation and Duke's Nicholas School of the Environment. He is at the Duke Marine Lab on the North Carolina coast near Beaufort. Professor Crowder, can you give us an update about how things look out there at the coast? Uh, things look great here in North Carolina. We're keeping an eye on the oil spill, of course. Okay, and also joining us by phone from the Gulf is Tina Thomas. She is a mar marine technician aboard the research vessel Cape Hatteras. She's by satellite phone. We're going to listen for a delay. Uh, Tina, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Great. It is good to have you, Tina. And we should say that this boat, the Cape Hatteras, a research vessel operated by Duke UNC Oceanic Consortium, Oceanographic Consortium. Tina, you've been blogging and sending photos from the Hatteras. So, Tina, uh, tell us where all eyes are focused on the Gulf. Can you tell us what you see, what you smell, what you hear being down there? Well, today um, the odor is not quite as present as it was yesterday. Um, you don't really smell much out there. There's um, little rusty globs, I would call them, and some are stringy in the water. You don't really see much of a sheen today. Yesterday we got special 24-hour um, permission to get within the five-mile radius that they've set up, and we were much closer then. The smell was a lot stronger. We decided to wear respirators when we were outside, and um, I could smell something that smelled like diesel fuel type yesterday, and then there's a, there's another smell that's around. I can't, I don't really know how to describe that. Yesterday we saw um, thicker globs of oil, lines of it in the water, um, and there was also a sheen almost everywhere. Uh, but there are a lot of boats out here, a lot of people working really hard out here. It's, uh, hey, it's kind of amazing. Can you say where you are, your proximity to the actual wellhead? We are five miles to the southwest of it. I'm, uh, I'm actually looking at it right now. They have two, it, the main flame, or the main drill ship has a flame coming off of it today. And then there's another uh, flame coming off of it. It looks like another rig. It's kind of hard to see from here. Tina, in your blog, you say that uh, in your role there, you've been running CTDs. Tell us, what are CTDs? What are you, what are you doing hands-on on the ship? Uh, well, CTD stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. So it's a seabird instrument package that has rosette bottles on it that we lower down into the water column. We've been going to about, um, on average, 1,400 meters, I would say. We lower it down. It gives us the temperature real time on a computer in the lab. It also gives us salinity. We have a transmissometer on there and um, two fluorometers. One measures CDOM. And there's also a, um, uh, what else, the oxygen sensor. Um, they seem to be interested in those readings. And Thank then you, Tina. when we get it to a certain... We I'm have sorry, had a question. A Christopher depth. has been reading your blog, and, and he asked, he had three questions. You can just uh, pick one here. What type of data is the Hatteras gathering? Are there any safety precautions working in such close proximity to the spill? And you've already mentioned about research vessels. He asked about other research vessels. So safety precautions in the type of data you're gathering. That's what Christopher asked. Okay. Um, safety precautions. We, we make sure if uh, we have some air monitors on board, and if the readings are high, 
And if the command center gives out a high VOC reading, then we're sure to wear respirators outside. Today, we have not felt the need to wear them. Um, I've heard there are other research vessels out here, but there are so many boats, it's hard to tell who is who. Um, so I haven't actually seen one. And uh, what type of gather data we're gathering? I believe they are measuring um, methane, and uh, they're also the temperature, salinity, fluorometer, transmissometer, oxygen. That's all on the CTD. We also pump water onto the onto the ship, and we measure sea surface temperature and sea surface salinity. Tina Thomas, well, thank you for checking in with us. We want to respect your time. You've got an important research mission down there. We don't want to interrupt you any further. So thank you for joining us. Okay, thank you very much. All right, that was Tina Thomas, a marine technician aboard the research vessel Cape Hatteras. And Professor Crowder, uh, I want to ask the next question of you, which is when you hear Tina explaining what she's doing, what sorts of data are you as a scientist eager to receive from the Gulf so that you can start to put together a picture of the marine ecology down there? Well, she mentioned uh, on the instrument something called a transmissometer. And basically what that does is ma uh, measure um, the amount of light that can pass through the water column. Uh, some of the early references to uh, underwater plumes uh, basically were measured using a transmissometer. And what the findings were is as you drop this profiler through the water column, there are parts of the water column that are cloudy. And the question is, are those clouds uh, deep plumes of oil or are they plumes of some other organic material, anything that could stop light from passing uh, through the transmissometer sensor? So uh, one of the key things that people are asking uh, is, are there subsurface plumes what direction are they going in? How extensive are they? Are they oil? Uh, and uh, in order to determine if they're oil, uh, you have to do additional chemical work, uh, and a number of people are looking at that. Uh, at this point, everything we know about the spill and its trajectory is inferred from satellite imagery and surface oceanographic models. Uh, but if there's oil at depth, we need to understand that uh, probably as importantly as the material at the surface. In Tim Profeta, we're mostly talking science here, but obviously in this situation you have an intersection of science and policy. Is there data coming out of the Gulf that which, would shape policy, say this deep water drilling moratorium or, or other policies of the government? Uh, well, you know, first, there's, there's very short-term policies being made by the people who are responding on the ground, and uh, the type of data that Hatteras is gathering is essential for them to understand where the risks are and where, where they need to deploy their resources. But thinking more in terms of more traditional energy policy about whether we have a moratorium on, on drilling on, in, in deep water like we do now for next uh, six month moratorium has been placed, I think the most important data point is the one of how much oil is coming out of the well and is it stopped. I don't think we're going to see a moratorium, uh, while it's very complex to impose a moratorium and with the, the, the economic impacts, the job impacts of that, I don't think that we can see our way politically to lifting that moratorium until we know we've stopped the gusher that is down there. So as long as that number is 60,000 barrels a day, um, uh, that data point probably is one that keeps the moratorium policy in place. The last point I'd like to make is that uh, uh, the president did announce that he's created a commission to study the data coming from the spill, uh, chaired by our the institute's chairman of the board, uh, Bill Riley, along with Senator Bob Graham, Graham of Florida, our former Senator Bob Graham. I think that's actually the proper venue to really evaluate this data and come up with policy prescriptions. This is a very dynamic, very volatile situation right now. Trying to design longer-term energy policy is going to be a very tricky business. And to have a commission that, of experts with resources that can sit and evaluate the data and come up with the policy prescriptions going forward is a good venture. Hey, Tim Profeta, I want to get into some of the questions that have come in. We're already into the politics. Obviously, mm -hmm. President Obama addressed the nation last night about this from the Oval Office. And this question comes from Mike. He's a uh, law student here, and he says, how does this spill change the political reality of climate change and energy legislation currently being discussed? How does it reshape election year political dynamics? That's a great question by Mike, and uh, it's, it's a very hard question to answer in what is a very dynamic situation, but I'm going to make a, take a good shot at it. Um, 
President last night clearly was making the case that this uh, oil spill creates an awareness in the American people that uh, there are real true social costs to us using mm -hmm. fossil fuels, costs of uh, environmental impacts, costs of our geopolitical exposure, mm -hmm. exposure, excuse me, because of uh, our dependence on oil and other things, mm -hmm. and that this could be a moment of awareness uh, through which we can move towards a more transformative energy policy, the sorts of things the President has been advocating, like policy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, policy to incentivize other energy sources. At the same time last night, he didn't quite direct the, 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 uh, the Congress to where he wanted to go. And he's going to have to overcome what is really a deep well of pessimism right now in, in Congress about whether we can get this done in election year. Um, politics is a very self-fulfilling business. If people don't think something's feasible, usually it becomes infeasible. Mm -hmm. And right now, uh, many of our members of Congress, many members of the Senate, feel that a large comprehensive energy bill is a difficult political lift in an election year. And can you remind us where we are? President Obama referenced the House yes. version of the bill that was passed. So, so bring us up to speed. What does that have? But he didn't seem wedded to that. Yeah, the, the House passed something uh, sponsored by Congressman Waxman and Markey mm -hmm. uh, in June of last year. It's a comprehensive bill. It has a portfolio of renewable power for the United States required in it. But its signature element is that it prices carbon. It creates a system that uh, caps the amount of greenhouse gases that are allowed to be emitted in the United States and makes you purchase that right to emit. And that by doing that, you change the economics of the energy sector such that you drive investment towards lower carbon, more sustainable technologies. Um, that's a proposal that's been in bo both houses of Congress for, co for, for multiple years and something that President Obama uh, made a priority when he was elected. Um, that proposal is now before the Senate uh, from Senator Kerry and Senator Lieberman and is part of the package that might be considered. That's the largest, most transformative push on energy policy and the one that, uh, that I think the president is going to really need to rally support to if he wants it to happen. Uh, because uh, right now, uh, there's many moderate Democrats, particularly those up for re-election, who think that could be uh, too politically adventurous in this election year, and they're going to need the president to really show them uh, uh, his desire to do it and, and push for it, uh, for it to happen. Professor Crowder, uh, speaking of President Obama's address last night, he emphasized the magnitude of this uh, disaster, of this uh, oil gushing into the Gulf. What are ways that you as a scientist get a hold of some numbers that can say this is the worst the, uh, environmental disaster? What are the, the actual measurements or characteristics that you're looking for? Well, I, I think that the, the most important thing has been the transition from 1,000 barrels a day to 40,000 barrels a day to 60,000 barrels a day. Uh, as we've watched this unfold, uh, it's become uh, a larger and larger problem. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of speculation about uh, rolling out those numbers. But getting the numbers and understanding the volume of oil we're dealing with is a key issue. This isn't a, a finite spill like the Exxon Valdez, 11 million gallons. This is a hemorrhage from the seafloor uh, that's going on day after day. And, and uh, every time there's an estimate, uh, the estimate seems to go up. Uh, we're now capturing more oil in the partial captures than people thought was coming out per day. Uh, and in the initial scientific data was just kind of trying to put together the story. When people were looking at the surface spill and estimating the volume, they said there's more oil on the surface of the ocean than BP is saying has been released. And so you begin matching up the evidence that you have against uh, the claims that are out there. And, uh, and as soon as the uh, oil spill um, video became available, uh, people began calculating what the release rates were and bumping up those estimates further and further. And so I think the, the big concern is that as we've gotten better and better estimates, um, the, the magnitude of the spill has gotten bigger and bigger. So we're talking about uh, tens of millions of gallons of oil already in the Gulf of Mexico with no uh, end in sight for, uh, for when that spill will stop. So um, it's unprecedented uh, in the history of oil drilling in the Gulf of Mexico and in terms of oil accidents in the United States. And Professor Crowder, there's this number that you mentioned of oil coming out of the well, but what about the effect when the oil goes out into the ocean, interacts with the, uh, the wildlife, interacts with the marine life there, gets into the ecosystems? How do you measure its impact on, the, you could say, the, the places and things that people care about? 
Well, I, I think that uh, impact is often judged by the public by how many oiled birds show up on the evening news. Um, and, and that's only the minor impacts here. Uh, what we know is that at this time of year in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, everybody is reproducing. The fish are spawning, the sea turtles are nesting, the seabirds are nesting and provisioning their young. Uh, so it's a, there's not a good time for an oil spill, but this is perhaps the worst time for an oil spill in the sense that, that uh, you know, it's the annual season of reproduction uh, and keeping the life going in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, some of the animals that have shown up, uh, hundreds of sea turtles, hundreds of seabirds uh, that have shown up dead or damaged by oil, uh, I would guess is the tip of the iceberg because the oil impacts on larval forms, uh, microscopic larvae of fish and invertebrates and so on. You'll never see those dead bodies on the beach or film at 11, but the impacts of oil on those vulnerable life stages are known to be devastating. I want to get to another question that's come in here, again, jumping off of uh, President Obama's speech, and that is the use of the military. Of course, he, he authorized uh, the National Guard to be deployed to the Gulf Coast. And so both Brigida and Gwyneth had questions along those lines of, hey, if the military can go charging into Haiti after the earthquake, uh, if, if the Navy has uh, technology for recovering submarines, uh, where's the military in this? So, uh, Tim Profeta, I know this isn't strictly your area of expertise, but um, are there ideas, precedents for how the military can be used in an environmental situation? Yeah, I, I, thank you for acknowledging it wasn't my area of expertise, but um, uh, <laughs> I, I do, you know, just uh, from observing past disasters, Hurricane Katrina, um, uh, floods, the military is usually one of the uh, institutions government that's most immediately called upon in situations like this because they have a rapid response capability because they have a clean uh, uh, line of authority, they're usually able to react quicker in disaster situations. So I'm not surprised that they were deployed here. Um, to some degree, the, you know, the military is increasingly, and the Coast Guard is increasingly taking over this recovery effort, but it has been this evolution um, from BP's leadership to, to the Coast Guard's leadership. And I think we've seen uh, critiques come in that that may have happened too slowly, but it's as we've seen these numbers increase in the order of magnitude as the uh, amount of oil that's gushing to the Gulf, I think the seriousness of the government responses increases as well, and thus the military leadership in, the, in recovery has increased because that's the easiest way the president has to get um, a rapid response to the area. And Professor Crowder, you've uh, testified before Congress about ocean ecology and ocean governance, kind of who's in control out in the ocean. I think this is uh, that in, in fast forward. So uh, how do you see uh, these issues about command and control and how the military might be able to, to do more good than harm? Yeah, I, I think the, the point about bringing in the military uh, to help control and, and manage the uh, decision making and so on is a really good idea for the, uh, for the reasons that Tim just pointed out. Uh, we do have to recognize that the, the capability of the military uh, in this situation is pretty limited because the military doesn't have experience with drilling in a mile of seawater um, and, and, uh, and with uh, remedying the, the uh, hemorrhage which is going on from the seafloor. Uh, BP can't do it uh, and they have the best of the ocean engineers from all the oil companies at work trying to do this. It's simply not expertise that the military has. Uh, I think that they can they can help focus the efforts and keep people on track. Uh, they can be a great line of communication between uh, the public um, and the government and BP. But uh, to a certain degree, this is a problem which is which is uh, kind of characterizes some of the issues with managing the oceans because uh, we have a confluence of private industry, uh, ocean regulators with various levels of effectiveness and various arms of the government that uh, that are dealing with different parts of this issue uh, and uh, and success depends on communicating with each other effectively and making good and fast decisions if you're just clicking into this webcast we're having an office hours conversation here at duke university about the oil gushing into the gulf of mexico you can participate in the conversation by sending an email to live at duke.edu you can tweet in your question with the tag duke live uh, Tim Profeta. Actually, let me toss this one to Larry Crowder. We've got another question here. 
and this one is from Deb Ittuk and Professor Crowder. She asked, what are the ramifications should a hurricane or tropical storm sweep through the oil-covered Gulf waters during the next few months and drop the Gulf water inland to areas that might not otherwise be directly impacted by the oil spill? We're in hurricane season. Professor Crowder, what about that scenario? Um, the hurricane, uh, I mean, the Gulf of Mexico does not need a hurricane at this point. Um, basically, I mean, we've seen the effect of a hurricane absent an oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, and it's devastating and challenges the response capacity of the government and the people. Uh, an oil spill is pushing those limits as well. Some people have argued that a good hurricane would break up this oil slick and spread it around. But what it would do first is drive oil into places uh, where we don't necessarily want to see oil go. Uh, it would take oil from a concentrated mass and distribute it everywhere. Uh, so I think um, when BP says they'll clean every clean up every drop of oil, it'd be a lot easier to clean it up if it's all kind of gathered up into an aggregate than spread all over the, the Gulf of Mexico. So I think a hurricane would be extremely bad news. And uh, we know for certain that the impact of a hurricane would uh, certainly delay uh, attempts to drill relief wells, uh, to clean up the spills that are already present and so on. So I don't see a positive side to a hurricane uh, coming into the Gulf at all. Of course, we don't control what happens during hurricane season. We've got another question that's come in here. This one from Linda and Tim Profeta. I want to ask it of you, uh, again, with the caveat that mm -hmm. you are not yourself an explosives expert, but <laughs> Linda has heard about this, explosives being an option for containing uh, stopping the well and implosion of the well. And so uh, I guess the question to, to you would be, how does uh, government officials vet all these ideas that are pouring in about what they should do? Yeah, there's actually a piece in the New York Times Magazine this weekend about uh, a gentleman up in Colombia who's advocating for the use of explosives to clo close the well, uh, something the Russians have apparently used three, four times to, to close um, leaking, uh, leaking wells in, in the past. Um, I, I, I am not an explosive expert. I, I tend to see it as a high-risk strategy uh, as a layperson. It's something that could cure it, but it could also create a much more open and, 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 and gaping, leaking area in, in the Gulf. And I think if you look at it through the lens of our policymakers, we tend in the United States to be averse to such high-risk strategies to, to address a disaster like this. I think it would be very hard to find a politician who would be willing to be accountable for a strategy if they thought that it could go disastrously wrong. And uh, without much further education, using explosives to close a well strikes me as a sort of uh, proposal that our politicians would be want to steer quite clear of. Uh, and that might be why you're seeing it not be picked up by the president and others. Professor Crowder, you can comment uh, if you'd like on the explosives question, but l let me toss you another one to try and get in as many as we can. A Twitter question says, hi, Larry. How much could the oil spill set back the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle population in terms of its recent recovery? Um, excellent question, and, and this is something I do know something about because I work on sea turtles. Um, the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle population is particularly at risk because they only nest in the Gulf of Mexico and no place else in the world. Uh, in the mid-60s, they were down to about 300 nesting females at their low. Uh, and in, in uh, about 20 years of effort since the mid-1980s, uh, we've gotten that population back up by a factor of 10. Uh, but it turns out that when they finish nesting in Mexico, they swim uh, close to shore all the way around the upper Gulf of Mexico and around the southern tip of Florida, uh, uh, migrating north to feed in the summertime. And so the Kemp's Ridley population uh, will be likely to swim directly through the path of the oil spill. Um, the same is true for loggerheads that nest in Florida. The hatchlings run off the beach and swim out to the Gulf Stream, which if the oil gets around that side of Florida, that's where the oil will be. So uh, I, I, I'm very concerned about some of the endangered species in the Gulf of Mexico. Kemp's Ridleys certainly are at risk uh, because of the oil, not directly at this point due to inundation of their nesting beach, but uh, I know when they finish nesting, which is in June sometime, uh, early July, they swim uh, right through where the oil spill is. The other species of great concern is a uh, uh, giant bluefin tuna. They nest, they nest, they spawn in two places in the entire world, Gulf of Mexico and the Mediterranean. And so the western 
North Atlantic bluefin population critically endangered uh, is spawning in their larvae in the water in the area where the oil spill is at, at the moment. Professor Crowder, we've got another ecology question here from Bob by email. Uh, there's a couple parts to it. Bob says, I've heard quite a bit about degradation of floating oil particles by specialized naturally occurring bacteria. Will these really denature a significant amount of the oil spilled given the warm gulf, different from the Prince William Sound? I've heard the objection that this would create an anoxic zone, but isn't that temporary? So uh, a question here about uh, the use of naturally occurring bacteria. Any thoughts along those lines? Yep, uh, this is a really great question. It's a little bit complex, so let me take it in parts. Um, you can begin uh, in ecology with uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch uh, statement here that, uh, you know, the microbes, there are microbes in the Gulf of Mexico that consume uh, uh, petroleum. Uh, and part of that's because they're natural uh, seeps of petroleum in the Gulf of Mexico all the time. So there's a population there uh, that can consume petroleum and basically convert it into uh, bacteria. Um, but uh, they've just been served up about 100 Thanksgiving dinners. And so it's going to be difficult for them to keep up with the amount of oil that's there. Uh, in the process, though, uh, they also respire and use oxygen. Um, and so in the Gulf of Mexico, as compared to Fr Prince, Prince William Sound, the warm water and the presence of these microbes is going to lead to a lot of bacterial decomposition of the oil. Uh, part of that bacterial decomposition will be consuming oxygen. And, and here's where things get a little bit more complex. If the oil is at the surface uh, and the bacteria consume the oil and consume oxygen, wind mixes oxygen right back into the water. If the oil is at depth uh, below where the water is stratified, where there's fresher water floating over saltier water, that decomposition will lead to reduced oxygen uh, that will remain in the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. And so I think there could be a few months out really serious oxygen problems related to the decomposition of this oil, and it's something we have to watch for. If you're just clicking into this webcast, we are having an office hours conversation here at Duke University about the oil gushing into the Gulf of Mexico. With me is Tim Profeta. He is the director of Duke's Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. Also with us by video conference is Professor Larry Crowder, and he studies marine ecology. You're invited to participate in this conversation. You can do that by sending a question by email, live at duke.edu. You can tweet in your question with the tag Duke Live or post a comment on the Duke University Facebook page. I wanna mention uh, another Duke person who's actually currently down in the Gulf of Mexico. She is a Duke Nicholas School alum, and that is Michelle Stogner. She's working for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And uh, Michelle has been sending us That's in some photos of what uh, life looks like right there in the Gulf. And, and I wanna mention Michelle because uh, her project is on assessing these underwater oil plumes and the effect that the dispersant might have on it. So I want to uh, toss this one both uh, Tim to you uh, and Professor Crowder as well. It, it coincides with a question by Richard asking about the breakdown uh, of the oil by the dispersants, how much dispersant is being used, In this question of is there more harm than good being done by some of these cleanup efforts and so, Tim Profeta, let me start with you about when you assess something like dispersant, at first it sounds like a great idea, but then on the backside, then you could have to clean up dispersant when you're done cleaning up oil. Um, so you mentioned the scientific committee that's being convened. Mm -hmm. How do you get expertise quickly to bear on these problems? Well, I think, um, I think the decision was, has been made to use the dispersants in, in uh, probably unprecedented amounts in the, in the mm -hmm. Gulf. Um, so I, I think the, the commission convened by the president would most be looking at the consequences of that decision mm -hmm. and, and, and what to do from here. Uh, there's great concern about the, use to, the, the widespread use of dispersants. Uh, many people who are familiar with the Valdez cleanup thought that some of the, the ecotoxicology of the dispersants was such that the dispersants may have done more damage than, than the oil. Um, but it is clear that uh, these dispersants have been used in large quantities without much um, evaluation of the trade-off, simply because of the direness of the situation. 
Um, I, there's also been others involved in the cleanup that have been concerned that the dispersion is actually changing the composition of the oil in a way that makes it less, less able to be captured by the booms and the like as it gets dispersed. It, it's no longer on the surface as a sheen that can be captured by a boom and it's just going under the, um, under the booms and, and, and accessing the, the marshes we're trying to avoid them getting to. I think Larry said earlier that, uh, that uh, the military doesn't have expertise in how to stop this gusher or clean up a, a spill of this magnitude. I think one of the things that's clear is there really isn't an institution that has the right expertise in how to, to deal with a disaster of this magnitude. We really are uh, well beyond our ability to access this deep water oil, far outstripped our ability to understand how to address uh, a disaster like this if something went well went wrong. So with the, whether it be dispersants or other things, we really are trying to figure out how to deal with this in real time as the water gushes into the Gulf, and it's, it's, it's quite tragic. Mm -hmm. Professor Crowder, what about you on Richard's question about dispersants? What do you know about their makeup and their potential effects on marine ecology? Um, yeah, I, I agree with Tim that we're into whole new territory here with the magnitude and application of dispersants. Uh, dis dispersants have been used for some time around small surface oil spills. Um, and they, they do have potential toxic effects, but it's a little bit like using dishwashing detergent when you're washing dishes. It helps break up the oil and run it down the drain. In this case, it helps break up the oil at the surface, which is uh, something that people desire to try to keep uh, oil from washing in on beaches and into marshes and so on. Uh, but uh, the application of dispersants a mile down in extremely cold, high pressure, uh, situations is something that, as far as I know, is entirely new territory here. Uh, so releasing the dispersants at depth is a new thing, and it may be related or correlated with the with numerous claims uh, for subsurface plumes. Uh, the The specific gravity of oil says it should flow to the surface, and we should see all of it there. But people are observing oil at depth, which may be related to the dispersants. And in terms of impacts on marine life. Uh, there, there, there is marine life that accesses the ocean via the surface to breathe or to feed, uh, but there are many marine organisms that would swim relatively safely under this surface plume, uh, but if they're subsurface plumes, all bets are off in terms of uh, how they're going to respond to those. And so um, I agree with Tim, the, the, decision here is a, the decisions have been made uh, to go in this direction to uh, reduce the risks of oil uh, impacting the land. Um, and, uh, and I'm concerned about whether people have thought through sufficiently the impacts of keeping that much oil at sea. Tim, we've got a question that I think is directed mm -hmm. towards you. It comes uh, from Jane, and she says, if the oil is not cleaned up by November, okay, of course, key time in politics, will that affect the midterm elections? What scenarios do you foresee uh, for major climate policy given the timeline of the cleanup and elections? What will voters be considering? I think uh, whether the oil is cleaned up or not, well, well let's just say the, the oil will not be cleaned up. In fact, <laughs> we'll be carrying the effects of this spill for decades, not months, and uh, the so it will not be cleaned up by November. So this will be uh, a uh, an issue very much still on the front page of the paper and, and, and uh, on cable news, and people will be aware of it. Um, if the, if the oil spill hasn't been dealt with in some way that's politically acceptable by American people, it could have grave consequences for the president and his party. And I think that's a lot of what the po political minds in the White House are concerned about. The echoes of the handling of C Hurricane Katrina by President Bush uh, in, this, in this handling of this disaster in the Gulf are very strong. And, and President Bush was held accountable politically for what was seen as his lackluster um, uh, response to Hurricane Katrina, and uh, I think the Obama White House is working very hard to not to develop a parallel. So, if this is not successfully dealt with in those, in whatever that means to the voter, uh, there'll be consequences for the president's party. As I said earlier, we will have a an energy debate this this um, in the Senate of the United States this summer. It uh, looks like it's going to be scheduled in July. Uh, but whether that's a, a debate just to address the oil spill, lifting the liability cap, um, working on some of the, uh, the regulatory approaches to drilling um, so that we are addressing the acute problem in, in the Gulf, or whether it's written large and is, talks about all comprehensive energy policy and moving ourselves away from fossil fuels and petroleum, 
is very much up in the air. Um, so, uh, and as I said earlier, I think the president is looking to, to that it seems to be looking to use the context of this to drive more comprehensive energy legislation because we do have this awareness that our usage of petroleum really brings cost to our society and we should move to, away from it. Uh, but he is really facing an uphill battle. There is a lot of pessimism uh, amongst politicians that this is a time of the election year where you could move something so comprehensive and so transformative. And, and where does the voters' pocketbook fit in this calculus? I mean, for President Obama in his address, he was sure to mention the economy at the top of his address before he got into the Gulf spill and uh, images of oil slick birds are, are uh, heart tugging. But when it comes to actually casting your ballot, uh, what about uh, the economy? Where, where's that going to fit? Well, I think the economy will be the biggest issue mm -hmm. in, in November. Um, uh, the con now, how does the economy relate to the oil spill in November? Uh, I'm not sure we're going to see much uh, nas nationwide consequence of the oil spill. Mm -hmm. um, we have deep and acute economic impacts in the fishing communities and the, and the tourism communities of the Gulf. Mm -hmm. uh, and those areas are going to be very upset if this isn't uh, dealt with and probably a very angry electorate going into, going into the midterm elections and that always hurts the party in power. Um, ac across the, the, the nation, the economy may, will be a dominant issue but it will probably be dictated much more by issues of European pol uh, finance policy than it will be actually in the Gulf. And the cost of this cleanup could end up being one of the reasons that people are able to move legislation because we need to find a funding source to clean up. Uh, but the president appears to be starting with BP as a, as, the, uh, as a party responsible for paying for the cleanup of this and, and today announced a $20 billion fund mm -hmm. uh, to be uh, independently mo um, managed uh, that BP will contribute to to pay for the cleanup. And I think that's where we're going to start uh, putting the price tag for, for this disaster. Mm -hmm. We've got a few hundred people participating here in this online office hours session. If you want to send in a question, do it by email, live at duke.edu. You can tweet in your question with the tag Duke Live or post it on the Duke University Facebook page. Professor Crowder, we've got a question for you. Uh, and this one comes from Matthew. And he asks, um, which animal populations are most harmed by the oil spill? He's got one in mind. He says the first one that comes to mind is the manatee, the sea cow. Don't you call it a sea cow? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that um, the manatees uh, are um, mainly distributed uh, around uh, South Florida and on the Atlantic coast. Uh, but I think all marine mammals are at risk because they're air breathers, and so they're swimming around and they have to come to the surface uh, to breathe. One can only hope that these organisms are pretty sensitive uh, to the odors uh, associated with oil and sort of stay away from the oil plumes. Uh, but the, uh, you know, the evidence, you know, there, there are films uh, of marine mammals swimming in and around the oil spills, turtles in and around the oil spills. Um, so I think that uh, the animals uh, that attract a fan base like turtles and seabirds and marine mammals will attract a lot of attention from the public. Uh, the animals that that uh, marine food webs depend upon uh, in the plankton and the critters that live on the bottom of the ocean and so on uh, are also going to be heavily impacted. Uh, but uh, you know they don't have the same fan base, although they feed the organisms that people care about. Um, if I could just add a, a, a comment to what Tim had to say about the economy, I think yes. the Gulf of Mexico is a perfect case that makes it clear that many, many ocean industries and economies and communities depend on healthy oceans. And when the health of the ocean is compromised by an event like this, it has pretty widespread effects. I mean, oil and gas and shipping are really important in the Gulf of Mexico, but so also is coastal tourism and recreational fishing uh, and commercial fishing and so on that depend on uh, a desirable uh, ocean, swimmable, fishable, surfable. Um, and uh, uh, there are many, many losses going on in the Gulf of Mexico now in the economy in areas that aren't being impacted by the oil uh, because people have uh, sort of turned off going on vacations uh, to the Gulf of Mexico. So economy and ecology are closely linked in almost all the coastal ecosystems of the United States. We've got a question here, and if uh, Tim Profeta and uh, Professor Larry Crowder, if you'll, if you'll roll with this one, we've got something of a challenge here that uh, Shannon posted on Facebook. 
uh, about the, the limits of uh, experts and expertise, and she said, just because they're Duke professors doesn't make their expertise gospel. How about asking the locals down there, they the locals being blocked are being blocked from helping themselves. Social and cultural effects are just as important as this country starving for oil for a while. So I, I hear this question of um, sort of the limits of a centralized government effort uh, and even the limits of uh, what the scientific community can tell us. And doesn't there need to be ownership from the people who live there, who fish there, make their living there? What, how about that interaction? Well, I, I don't think either Larry or I would deny that, that those are the people the most skin in the game and, and most knowledge of their, their own ecosystems, their own livelihoods, and uh, certainly it should be a big piece of, of, of what we do about it. I think uh, what we've seen is maybe even in the vacuum of, of leadership that could have occurred earlier, early in the spill, we've seen a number of those local communities act and, and take, take the reins and ownership uh, maybe most dramatically with uh, Governor Louisiana and his construction desire to construct new barrier islands, but individual parishes in Louisiana putting out their their, their fishing fleets, laying out booms, doing everything they possibly can. Um, I you know yes, Larry and I are, are, are experts in our fields and can speak to it, but but there are certain things that only the people who live there and 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 and, and survive there can can speak to. So I would agree with the with with the the poster, I guess. Mm -hmm. Professor Crowder, what about you, this uh, relationship between the scientific community, sometimes outside experts coming from out of town, and the people who actually uh, live down on the Gulf Coast? Uh, you know, I, I think Tim's absolutely right. There, that none of us uh, would disagree with the notion that the, the local people uh, know and understand the waters, uh, the, the importance and function of the marshes, the links between uh, functional ecosystems and and prosperous economies and stable communities. That's why they're so mad. That's why they're so frustrated, because this is like an external event to them, an oil company drilling 48 miles offshore uh, who assured everybody that they would not have a catastrophic spill, in fact, have a catastrophic spill, one that they can't mediate or moderate at the moment. And so uh, that people in that community feel victimized in the same way that they felt victimized by Katrina uh, is is not surprising, and I, I think the scientific community needs to listen to those folks and figure out uh, how we can help, uh, you know, share the knowledge that we have and share the knowledge that they have, and work towards solutions. Uh, part of the problem here is that the the, the fix of the well around the well uh, is a highly technical operation uh, that not that many people are suited to do. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, we've got a couple more questions that have come in here by Twitter, uh, some kind of rubber meets the road questions uh, that, again, I think have both a, a political and an ecological dimension to them. So the first one is thoughts about the safety of Gulf seafood when no test results have been released. So, uh, Professor Crowder, let's start with you. Uh, when I go to the supermarket, should I ask, where is this fish from? And if they say the Gulf, should I steer clear or is it probably okay? Uh, well, we could begin with the notion that not very many people know where their food comes from, uh, whether it's chicken or beef or eggs or vegetables. Um, and knowing where your seafood comes from is fairly difficult. Uh, but uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service and NOAA, larger NOAA, has taken extreme precautions here to close areas uh, in the Gulf of Mexico uh, any distance, any reasonable distance from oil impacts. Uh, to protect exactly against this concern that seafood that's in the marketplace uh, was taken external to where the oil impacts are. Uh, so the fisheries closures are really quite large at this point. Uh, and that's, that's an effort to maintain the confidence uh, of the U.S. seafood consumer. Um, so I, I think that uh, really adequate precautions are being taken. Uh, what will be problematic is that a very large proportion of the seafood produced in the U.S. that enters the U.S. market comes from the Gulf of Mexico, and large portions of those fisheries are going to be out of play uh, for much of the summer and maybe for the next several years. And so there will be an impact on seafood prices, on where seafood comes from, uh, but I don't have concerns at all about seafood safety. I think they're pretty substantial precautions in place to assure that the supplies that come out of the parts of the Gulf are coming out of parts that are not impacted by oil. 
Yeah, I, if I could, I, I think Larry's uh, answer really captures you know, the precautions that are being made by by our government to make sure that this shouldn't be a concern to the to the the, the person on Twitter. I, the, I just wanted to add the number that I saw recently was about 37 percent, or almost 40 percent, of the Gulf of Mexico is shut down right now in terms of fishing. So that's all, you're nearing half of the Gulf is actually off limits. Which give you a sense of the magnitude of the areas they've closed to make sure that the, uh, the seafood uh, supply stays safe. And Tim Profeta, what about the government communications uh, mission here? I mean, we hear a lot about how much oil is being uh, coming out of this well, which is interesting, but uh, probably more practical is can I buy this fish or not? What about communicating, you know, this fish is safe, here's how we're, we're dealing with these practical parts? Well, I think... Um it probably is, but does behoove the federal government to to make that clear. To, if, if it's not clear to the to the consumer, I think, as Larry said, uh, no one National Marine Fisheries Service have have done this for that very reason to make sure that the consumer uh, confidence in the product stays stays high, so we don't have a further economic consequence of the spill being that a healthy uh, seafood is is also now not not something that's palatable to consumers. So. Uh, to the degree that the communications challenge hasn't been met, then it would behoove the government to make sure that people know in the supermarket that what's going to reach their shelf uh, is safe. To Profeta and Larry Crowder, we've got another uh, provocative Twitter question here. And if people are watching, you can also tweet in your own answer to this. Use the tag Duke Live. And so the Twitter question is, does it really do any good to boycott BP gas stations right now? Larry Crowder, let's start with you. Uh, are you buying gas from BP? What's your recommendation? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that after uh, after Exxon Valdez, uh, there was a huge campaign to boycott Exxon to try to encourage that company to be more responsible corporate citizens. Um, I think you know there's a similar uh, thing likely to happen with BP, where people question whether they want to be purchasing their gas uh, from BP. Uh, one of the complications is a lot of gas stations that you drive by are not corporate BP stations, but they're run by people in your local community who run those businesses. And so boycotting BP uh, may have a smaller effect on BP than it has in your local community by the uh, owner of that, uh, that uh, gas station market uh, sort of the thing that you're at. Uh, the other thing that people need to understand is that the distribution system for petroleum in the United States uh, involves distribution of petroleum from wherever it's taken in the U.S. or, uh, or internationally uh, through a, a very complicated marketing system where individual companies like BP uh, f finish off their product with additives and things like that. But a lot of the refined gasoline comes through a, a very main pipeline. So um, I think rather than, uh, I mean, I, I welcome people to boycott BP. What they ought to be rethinking is their use of energy uh, in their homes, in their cars, how do they get from one place to another? Um, you know, I think that's the challenge that we face. In fact, I, my view is uh, everybody that uses gasoline is complicit in this crisis in some way. Tim Profeta, do you fill up at BP? Uh, let me let me um, pick up right where Larry left off. I think BP is part of a complex economic sector, and. Uh, clearly has uh, a great deal of culpability here, but also is uh, part of an oil sector to, in which it could happen to many many different corporations. Um, I think what people should be doing is trying to figure out how we can move beyond the use of petroleum, uh, because there is this great cost of using petroleum that we don't see every day. It's not on your credit card bill, but it's in the air, it's in the cleanup of the Gulf, and it's in, it's in the price it takes us to uh, protect our interests in the Middle East. And we have to find a way to get that cost into our decision making. If we could ever successfully do that, I, I assure you, petroleum would not be the way we'd want to power our transportation sector in the United States. So I'd, I'd, I, I would counsel people to try and move away from petroleum, not just BP. Um, I think it's actually an interesting question about BP is that BP has long been thought of as the most progressive green company. It was always BP, but beyond petroleum. And they still do have some very interesting um, uh, policy pushes towards renewables and, and great investments across what things, people think about green technologies. So you have a company that's taken a kind of a green stance, but now has had a horrible safety record. So in one part, they've done well. One part, they've clearly created one of the environmental disasters of our generation. Uh, how do you balance that? 
And the, and, and the last thing I'd say is to the degree that uh, a boycott of BP would lead to the, the dissolution of BP and maybe the bankruptcy of BP, it's not clear that that benefits the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it so it's the better thing to do, go to BP so they have the money to clean up. Well, I think you should <laughs> probably go to the, to, 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 the, to the place you've been going to uh, for, for all the other reasons and then think about using less gasoline not being complicit in, 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 in the use of petroleum by the United States economy. And think about, about what we need to do as a government and a country to move beyond uh, this, this petroleum dependence we have. Very good. Tim Profeta and Larry Crowder, we're coming up on the end of our office hour, but I want to get in one more question here for you, Professor Crowder. Uh, it comes from an Emily Crowder, whom you may know, I don't, I'm not sure. And she asks, how does this affect fisheries and the condition of the estuaries? Uh, well, you know, I think that it's pretty clear that the, the, there's going to be a devastating effect on commercial fisheries. They're already closed. Uh, and what some people don't recognize is, is that the estuaries uh, in the Gulf of Mexico uh, along the Atlantic coast of the U.S. are actually the nursery ground for uh, something like 80 to 90 percent of the commercial fish and shellfish harvested in the U.S. So uh, the concern about oil getting into the estuaries, into the wetlands, is, is a very valid one. One, it's a habitat that's very hard to clean, uh, to remove the oil compared to uh, steam washing rocky coastlines uh, as we did for Exxon Valdez. Uh, and it's also an, an, a habitat that we know is critical to support fish production uh, for many, many of the fish and shellfish that the markets depend on. And so, again, there, there are really strong ties between this kind of environmental effect and uh, production in fisheries. Very good. Professor Larry Crowder, thank you for uh, holding these online office hours. Thank you. Professor Larry Crowder has joined us from the Duke Marine Lab in Beaufort, North Carolina. He is the Stephen Toth Professor of Marine Biology and the Director of the Center for Marine Conservation and Duke's Nicholas School of the Environment. Tim Profeta, thank you for uh, holding online office hours here. Thank you. It was a pleasure to join you. Good. Uh, Tim Profeta is director of the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. You can follow the engagement of the Duke community with this Gulf oil spill on a special website at nicholas.duke.edu. That's nicholas.duke.edu slash oil spill. You'll be able to find a recording of this office hours session and many other Duke videos on the Duke On Demand website and that is ondemand.duke.edu. And to learn more about Duke, visit duke.edu.